words that we need to look at. It says that the leader is not quarrelsome, not one who's contentious, not one of those people that you feel like when you get into the presence you have to really walk on eggshells, you know, have to be very careful what subjects you bring up, what tone of voice, don't look them in the eye, that kind of thing. <clears throat> you don't want to be that person that you, you receive a three-hour lecture about what you've done wrong and what's going to happen to you because of it. A person with a quarrelsome attitude leaves a guarded heart on everybody they deal with. Because you don't want to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, and so you just kind of pull back and build a wall up around you to protect you from what's going on in their life. We want to have a person in leadership with whom people can be open, who can bring up difficult subjects and not get exploded from, who can say what's really on their mind, and even if it's foolish, not be made to feel a total fool because of it. We need people who lead us who can hear our faults and see our weaknesses and come alongside and build us up and give us strength and encourage us. You know, it's so easy as a leader to be totally right about the facts and what needs to be done, but totally wrong in the way we handle the person who needs that information. A kindness and a forbearance and an encouragement, even when people are being really, really foolish. And that's a hard thing to do. A hard thing to do. So we make a point of not driving our brothers and sisters away from Christ judgment and by harsh criticism. We want to do great things in the church and we need to express the truth with love. Paul always talked about those two things, preaching the truth in love, with love, with encouragement. And so there's a gentle, gentle and kindly that that leader needs to become. Not quarrelsome, but kindly and gentle with those who Fifthly, he says, the leader of the church not, needs to not be money love. Somebody consumed with money and its uses and its purposes. <coughs> One of the most difficult parables that Jesus ever told, difficult for me to understand, was the parable of the unscrupulous steward. You know the one I'm talking about? Uh, there was a certain man, Jesus told the story, a certain man who was managing and counsel a wealthy person. And he was saving money for himself. And the, the, uh, the owner got wind of it and said, look, bring the books. We're going to settle accounts. I found out you've been cheating, you've been cheating me. And you're going to be out of here. And the man, having done this so far, looked around himself and said to himself, I'm not strong enough to dig ditches and I'm too proud to beg. What am I going to do? And what he did was take more of the master's money and owed that master of debt and said, I'm going to write this off so much. Only about half that you're, um, you're going to owe from now on. That's hard, hard for me to hear. Very difficult. To come back. That's cheap. That's stupid. That's abusing power. This is not what God's about at all. And I'm sure the people that Jesus told the story to were scandalized as well. But he's making a very powerful do we use people and squeeze people in order to get money? Or do we use money in order to bless people? Which is the more powerful force and the more powerful purpose in our life? What is truly valuable to us? Well, for the wealth of people, bless and give them strength. This parable does not promote unscrupulous behavior, but it does challenge our view of wealth and what it means to us. What is the first thing that we are to be blessed by? That wealth or the people that we bless? When we go into a restaurant, 
Are we looking for the benefit of the moment well, or for the eternal benefit of investing in people? And, and we need to look around and see that the people around us is just not playing with Joe or Bill. It's a person that God made with unlimited capacity to give the opportunity. They're made for eternity and an eternal purpose. And not just for this moment in life. So it's true that we should be building those people as we invest in God's, God's kingdom. They have a value far beyond just this moment in time and what they can produce. And all of these things as we look at them, the elder is to be, the overseer is to be a people builder, a grower, a blesser, a changer. What is our philosophy of management as we think about leadership? Uh, I could call one the, the orange juice method of leadership. <laughs> we see this very commonly in corporations today, the orange juice method. You go out and you, you buy the very biggest, plumpest, and most beautiful oranges you have. You bring them home, you wash them off, you cut them in half, and you squeeze every last drop of juice out of them, out of the pulp, everything. Go husk away and go on to the next one. That's the orange juice thing. You might call the second philosophy of management the orange tree model. You want an orange orchard? You call it orange tree. It's a grow business. It's not an orchard, it's a grow, but it's an orange grow. What do you do? You go out and you find the best seedlings that you can. You plant them in perfectly straight rows. You dig around them so they can get a water and pep them. You fertilize them. You protect them from bugs. You shelter them from the too much heat by cooling it however way you can. And in Florida, when it gets too cold, they'll stay out all night. They'll set fires amongst those trees to try to provide some kind of warmth in order that that tree won't be frozen. They shepherd them by people who their children. That's how they treat those orange trees. They protect them and provide for them in every way in the hopes that that grove will grow to be productive, profitable, and worth and worthwhile. And just so, this is the leadership that God has for this church, the fellowship. They who are working to build the church in the likeness of Christ, cultivate, groom, prepare, and the in the right way. Thank you. 